So one, tenet one, what is real is that you are loved. This is real. Reality is eros. Its insides are lined with love. It's an amorous cosmos. It's an intimate universe. God is the infinite intimate. There's more God to come. And it matters. That's two. What's true is you're not alone. Right? So one and two. Love is real. Right? You're not alone. Right? Reality is eros. It's in a communion. Everything's connected to everything else. And three, justice matters. Right? And four, you're on a journey. And I want to today perhaps, you know, press a little bit of a, a, a reset on one mountain. Okay, we, we've had such a, an insanely great journey, right? Like an insanely great journey. And we're about to start the next part of that journey. We'll have in the next couple of weeks, we'll have a, an after one mountain meeting about kind of how do we take the next steps and energize one mountain the next level? which is so, you know, insanely critical to do now. And it's such a, 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 a stunning place to be. You know, I was with my son. I just walked in from the, um, the, the North Conway and we just had this, this, this beautiful weekend. And we were talking about one mountain, right? And we we're talking about, you know, the places I asked Zion, like, where do you feel like completely opened up in love? All right. And he said, you know, he gave his list of answers, you know, which were really beautiful. And I said, you know, one of those places is actually one mountain. And when I come to one mountain and I'm surrounded by, and I'm looking in the chat box and I'm surrounded by, by friends and colleagues and students and interlocutors and co-creators, and we're looking together towards the future. And we're responding to the meta crisis and we're living in celebration and we're holding the laughter out of one side of our mouths and the tears out of the other side. And most important, at the heart of the revolution is we are telling the new story of value based on a field of first principles and first values because we actually understand that only telling a new story of value out of which we create the future, out of which we articulate the memory of the future can respond to the meta crisis. That's the core of one mountain. The core of one mountain is this understanding that we are at this time between worlds. And that phrase, a time between worlds, came out of the center, came, um, came out of our work together. We call it a time between worlds or a time between stories. Zach uses the phrase a time between worlds. I use the phrase a time between stories. And that in that time in between, in that space in between, when the old world order is breaking down, either it's going to devolve and collapse or in that space in between, there's going to be a breakthrough like that which happened in modernity in which this new story of, of reality was told. And as we've said here many times, but I want to just relocate ourselves as we reset in one mountain to the extent that they got the plot line right. And let's just open our hearts to the extent they got the plot line right of this new story we birthed the great dignities of modernity. But to the precise extent that they missed pieces of the plot line, the dignities of modernity themselves wound up creating a structure which crossed planetary boundaries because it was a structure driven by rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics that governed all relationships that created exponential growth curves that fell off, that created massive gaps between have and have nots, that actually emptied the field of meaning, emptied the field of value, 
everything became but a social construction of reality. And the only thing, the only story that guided us was a success story and perhaps a personal romantic story. And that structure of society drove this rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics right off a cliff. We created complicated, fragile systems. We crossed planetary boundaries, as I just said. And we now have 14, 15 different vectors in which existential risk is more real than you can possibly imagine. So how do we respond? How do we actually take the metacrisis seriously? And some of you are saying, kind of, we know that already. Let's get down to the new Dharma this week. Let's not rehearse that, right? You know, we actually don't look away. That's the nature of one mountain. We don't look away. We look into, we feel into, we actually feel where we are. We are evolution feeling itself through us. We are the, the pulse, the throb, the tumescence, right? Of she, of the evolutionary love unfolding itself, feeling herself through us. And we look around and we feel the whole. That's what the crossing means. The crossing means I don't look away. The crossing means I cross over from the side of Homo sapien who's involved in his or her own win-lose metrics, whether it's religion against religion or a nation against nation or family against family or within a division of a company, employee against employee or executive against executive or company against company. We step out of that, that narrow, myopic, view of reality, that temporally myopic view. Temporally myopic meaning I can only see my narrow short-term dimension of time. And we expand our consciousness, we expand our view. In this expanded view, we feel the future. We literally feel the future in us. We're not in this kind of petty contraction, you know, you know, using spirituality to try and kind of emerge out of my, you know, kind of crisis. Maybe I'll emerge a little bit, I'll do a bunch of podcasts. No, no, that's not what we're doing. We're saying we actually feel the suffering of reality and we feel the joy of reality in us. We're actually homo amor. We are the elite. We don't wait for the elite. We are the prophets. We don't wait for the prophets. We are the sages and the seers. We don't wait for the sages and the seers. We are the revolutionaries. We don't wait for some revolution to happen someplace else. We feel it all. We feel it moving through us. And we democratize the capacity to feel that feeling. That feeling becomes not the feeling just of this narrow sector of humanity dissociated right from the larger masses of people, the throbbing, teeming masses of people. There's not some little group that's kind of separate that kind of they're looking down and they get it. They're going to lead us. No, no, no. There's no room like that. There's no room of people like that. They don't exist. Not in the rooms, the halls of the prophets and not in the halls of the sages and not in the halls of the intelligence agencies. And right, not in the whole the halls of the you know risk scenario folks in the different departments of governments around the world. There's no room that's going to save it. What's going to save it? What's going to change it? What's going to shift it? What's going to actually respond effectively to the meta crisis and allow us to actually avoid the death of humanity or the potential death of our humanity? Two kinds of existential risk is actually generating a new humanity, right? Like wow. Right? The realization I can actually become something more. I can live a bigger life. I can play a bigger game. I can actually participate directly in the evolution of love. And that happens by actually transforming myself. I become something new. But I don't just feel a little different. I am different. I'm not a better version of myself. I'm a new self. There's a new me. Right? And that movement is not a fanciful movement. That's not some strange, weird, you know, impossible, idyllic, you know, fundamentalist vision of rapture or new age vision of the same. No, it is actually the inexorable movement of cosmos itself. Cosmos moves towards evolution from matter to life to the depths of the self-reflective human mind. And the self-reflective human mind deepens and deepens and deepens until precisely at a moment of crisis, right, there's this new birth. And the new birth is actually literally a new emergent, just like matter went through all of its levels and triumphed as life. And life went through all of its levels and triumphed as the self of the depth of the self-reflective human mind. So the self-reflective human mind goes through all of its levels 
And then, like always, it hits a crisis. The crisis is always a crisis of intimacy. It's a crisis of relationship. The parts of the system don't know each other. There's billions and billions of people on the planet, but they're all governed by win-lose metrics. There's no coherence. There's no resonance because there's no intimacy. So there's a global intimacy disorder. And so we then restore intimacy by the emergence of a new level of intimacy, an evolutionary intimacy, a new quality of intimacy, a new quality of human being, right? Literally, Christ the Savior is born. But Christ the Savior is born is you, is me, is we, right? We become the Christed ones. We become the new prophets. We become the new sages, we become the new activists, we become the new economists, the new politicians, even the new data scientists that are doing data science in an entirely new way. We become homo amor, we cross to the other side. I actually shift the way I experience reality. And I can make that shift and I can do that crossing simply right now in this very second. If that crossing doesn't mean that I need to go head an intelligence agency, I don't even need to write a book. I shift something inside of me. That's what the crossing means. Something inside of me shifts. What's, what shifts? I move from the side of Homo sapien, who's involved in his or her own win-lose metrics, who loves a very narrow group of people. And I realize that I'm not Homo sapien. I'm actually part of the whole. I'm related to the whole. I'm omni-considerate for the sake of the whole. I'm omni-responsible for the sake of the whole. The pulsing that pulses in me is the evolutionary impulse. I feel the whole. I participate in the whole. I am a unique expression of the currency of eros, of the currency of amor, of love that moves through reality. I become the new human. I become homo amor, the new humanity, the new, the new, the new genus, the new humanity, and the new human homo amor which means I realize I'm participatory in the field of Eros. I'm participatory in the field of desire. And as I clarify my desire and I clarify my story and I realize that my story is a love story and I clarify my interiority and I clarify my intention and I fix my broken vessels because every human being has broken vessels and I fix my traumas and I fix my lies and I fix my delusions. One at a time, in the smallest way I can, my intention is no longer psychological. I'm not fixing myself for the sake merely of my psychology. I realize that psychology is the metaphysics of the whole. Psychology is, is the psyche of the whole. That actually my interiority, my, my insides affects everything. That mala mala say the interior scientists in the second century, know that which is above, meaning know the whole thing, mimcha, emerges from the depth of your interiority. That's home one more. I know that what pulses inside of me is the heart, the throb, right? The beating, right? Tumescent vibratory impulse of evolutionary love itself uniquely beating in me and therefore through my shifting and reshaping and recasting and, and developing and evolving and transforming my own interior, I change the whole thing. I literally have the capacity to be a mad lover that changes the whole thing. Not, not an ordinary lover, an outrageous lover, right? Mad love, mad love, right? Mad love. The only sanity is mad love. And we call that l'shem michud. Right? In the 16th century, Isaac Luria called that l'shem yichud, every action I take is for the sake of intimate communion between all the split off parts. L'shem yichud kuchav rihu right? Every action I take through my healing the split off parts of myself creates intimate communion all the way down and all the way up. Wow. Okay, that's, that's who we are. That's the reset. Okay, that's who we are. So we're here in one mountain to become homo or to cross to the other side. And there's, there's no more insane joy than being on the other side, right? To actually know that I'm never powerless, that actually everything that happens inside of me is significant, witnessed, that I'm personally addressed by reality, by all of reality, 
by her personal infinite face, by God who is the infinite intimate, and that I have the capacity to personally address reality. So to cross over is to cross over to the side of love. So that's what we're going to talk about this week. We're going to talk about the side of love. So we're going to read a code. We're going to enter into this dharma. We're going to do it in a, a unique, wild way today that we've never, ever, ever done it before. I'm really excited to share something just kind of unimaginable with you today. Then I'm going to turn, we're going to, to Kristen, we're going to do prayer. And, you know, we've, we've, we've been so intense in the Dharma, sometimes we haven't done prayer at the end. Some people reminded me today at the pre-meeting, so I apologize for that. We'll do prayer at the end with Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. And we'll try and do it every week. From now on, we'll do like a different Hallelujah every week because Hallelujah has more covers than any other song. And Hallelujah is, is the evolutionary impulse, right? Is the personal intimate face of divinity that lives in my life and my holy and broken Hallelujah that awakens in the public square. Hallelujah has left the church. It's now in the public square. That's what Leonard did. That's why we chose his song. And that's the place we pray. So we actually play Hallelujah. And then right, people write, all of us, we write prayers in the chat box. I'm going to ask everybody. Shakti is going to lead us and model it. We write prayers in the chat box and we'll read some of the prayers and we'll close. It's so crazy, crazy, crazy delight to be here with you, right? In the revolution, right? In telling this new story of value. So we're going to try and tell a new chapter, right, today. So I'm, I'm madly delighted to thank Krista for the, the gorgeous opening, to thank Taylor for the beautiful Dharma recapitulation, right? To thank Jamie and JL, Jack and Lily for just kind of holding, right, the space in all the ways that you do. And David, Right? Read us that code, brother. Welcome, everyone. So this code's the same one as last week, but it's we can return to it and go deeper. You know, there's so many, there's so many ways that my heart is pulled in this world, right? The outrageous pain. And to be able to come back and sort of reorient myself to deepening my own sense of who I am and, and what's there to do and how do I make sense of this world. That's what this code helps us to do. So here's this week's evolutionary love code. There is only one side, the side of love. What that means about what should be done is a question of impossible complexity, pain, and uncertainty. We stand for a culture of eros against a culture of death. We stand for intimacy against alienation. This requires us to be both tender and fierce to stand for love against all forms of unlove. So distinctions around value are an expression of love. Love and unlove are real, but love and unlove are not an inherent split on racial, national, ethnic, or religious grounds. That kind of thinking itself is an expression of unlove and anti-value that in and of itself is the cause of so much horror. There is only one side, the side of love. We all stand together on the side of love. In our formulation, good and evil is discerned simply. To be good is to stand for love. No one is outside the circle of love. To be on the side of love requires the cultivation of radical discernment within a broken information ecology. There is only one side, the side of love. We all stand together on the side of love. And I turn my word back to you, Dr. Mark. Good. David, thank you for that beautiful quote. There's lots of things to handle in the world. Everybody ready? We're going to take a crazy deep dive now, okay? This is going to be kind of a crazy deep dive. And we want to, we want to advance the Dharma, right? Now, when I say... When I say to advance the Dharma, do, do, you get, do you get what I mean? The Dharma is the, the nature of reality. So imagine that you are Steven Weinberg, right, who died recently, who won the Nobel Prize for his work in muons. And imagine your ecstasy when you begin to understand something new about muons, because you're saying, okay, I'm understanding something about the core structure of reality. So there's a structure of reality in its exteriors, in its mechanics, and there's a structure of reality in its melody, in its music, in its 
interiors. And reality, as Nietzsche understood, reality mocked people who looked at reality just as mechanics and not as music. And at a, at a different point, I just sent recently Krista um, a piece, right, um, that I wrote on mechanics and music. So there's the mechanics of cosmos, there's the music of the cosmos, and that essay, we, we looked a lot at Nietzsche and how Nietzsche understands this relationship between mechanics and music. Okay, does that make sense? So what we're doing in advancing the Dharma today is we, we actually want to understand and feel and even write a new note in the music of cosmos. It's because when I understand and I can write the note, it means I'm hearing the music. Beethoven actually hears the music. So when I can hear the music, I can write the symphony, whether in notes or I just organize the symphony as Beethoven sometimes did. So <clears throat> when I'm pressed into reality, right? Beethoven was pressed by the suffering of his life, by his deafness, but different things press me into reality. And I get so pressed into reality that the music clarifies. When the music clarifies, we try and get it down in the symphony. Right, you know, Beethoven's fourth, da 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 da, right? So in other words, you, you understand something new. So what we wanna do is we wanna advance the Dharma, but this music that we're trying to hear and, 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 and put notes to this music isn't just another casual symphony. We're trying to write the, not the national anthem, but the cosmic anthem not even the global anthem, the cosmic anthem. What is the anthem of music and value that unites us, right? That we all rally to, that we feel, okay, we're all part of this together. That's what we mean by a shared story of value. But does that help everyone? I'm, I'm kind of talking about the shared story of value in terms of music, but it's this music, this is our song, right? And, and that song, you know, and a couple often has, a couple can be two friends, right? It can be, you know, a, a, a people in a biological bond. It can be people in a, in a, who are creating together, right? A deep, deep, deep friendship of, of evolutionary beloved home mates, right? It can be a romantic couple, but often people have their song. This is our song. You should always have your song with your friends, right? And then a country has a song. That's the national anthem. And then can you imagine there's a global anthem, right? And then imagine there's not just a global anthem, but there's a cosmic anthem because value is not just global, value is actually cosmic, right? And the, the national anthem expresses the music of the nation, right? And the global anthem, the music of the globe, the world spirituality. But imagine that the world spirituality is rooted not just in social conventions of humanity, but humanity is, is an expression of the universe. And the universe is, is a story of value. Value is backed by the universe, it's not just a social contrivance. So then there'd be a cosmic anthem, okay? I, you know, I've, I've mentioned Zion today. Um, you know, he, he likes soccer games and there's a, a team, a soccer team in, in San Jose. So we went to a soccer game in San Jose and, um, and, and they sang the national anthem. And I'm like, I, I cannot stop crying during the national anthem. And every time I go with him to a soccer game, like I can't get through the national anthem because everyone stands up from different parts of life and, you know, different backgrounds. And, you know, most of the people in that particular stadium were immigrants to America, but lots of them, you know, incredible, you know, Hispanic roots. And there's the sense of generosity in the air and there's the sense of struggle in the air. And then the Star Spangled Banner comes on and people stand up and at that moment, differences drop away and you can feel the eros you can feel the love you can feel the intimate communion right for a moment so imagine if we had a cosmic anthem right that song that calls us because the, the special song is not just between two beloveds it's a special song between all of us that calls us to our best so that's what we mean by a new story of value so when I say we want to advance the Dharma, the Dharma is the ring of Sauron, right? The Dharma is the most alluring, wondrous possibility, but you can't make the Dharma yours, right? What happens when a particular nation says the ring is mine, I'm going to go destroy everyone because I've got some understanding of the ring, right? That, that's religious wars. Whether the religious wars are communists killing people, right? Or Khmer Rouge, 
right? Different versions of communism, right? Or or classical religious wars and in in the pre-modern world or the Thirty Year War in Europe, right? Religious wars take on many guises, right? In other words, the the secular ideologies of the 20th century killed more people because they had more sophisticated weaponry than all the previous religious wars. But wars means I, I, I actually have this intuition. I, I understand something that it's true. There's a spark of the sacred, but then from that spark of the sacred, I construct a false story. And instead of it being a cosmological story of value, right, the, the Dharma becomes my attempt to take the ring of Sauron and make it mine. The ring of Sauron is the, the ring of power from Tolkien's great trilogy, The Lord of the Rings. And whoever tries to own the ring, you try and own the ring, it destroys you. The ring belongs to everyone. Right? We all carry the ring together, right? And the ring is right, that which should encircle us, right? It's the shared story of value, okay? So, okay, we, we don't, and this is what we were saying in the pre-meeting, those from the pre-meeting, we never take it for granted, right? right? When, when we come to one mountain, we're making love, right? We're kind of, we're making love with the Dharma, we're creating it new and we, we, step in, we step in all the way. So here we go. So David, thank you for the code. And now we're gonna we're gonna step into a a very, very particular story. I'm gonna read you something we've never done before in One Mountain. I'm gonna actually read you a story from the New York Times this morning. Right, this morning. And it's about being on the side of love. So that the name of the article is an athe an atheist chaplain and a death row inmate's final hours, okay? And it doesn't matter whether you read the article or not, okay? It's a story about an, an atheist chaplain, right, in Oklahoma working with an atheist inmate who has been condemned to death. So let me read you the story, okay? And our Dharma for today, our, our topic is to stand on the side of love. So I wanna, this is our third week of talking about standing on the side of love, right? So what does it mean to stand on the side of love? Right, that's our question. Okay, so we want to deepen that understanding. Right, what does it mean to cross over and to stand on the side of love? God, that chicken. Devin Moss had a voice that rumbles low and slow like distant thunder, but this morning it was softer, more contemplative. Devin Moss is the, main, the name of the, the pastor. And the, the gentleman who was going to be executed Right, Hancock is his name, had asked for one, you know, he was a death row inmate in Oklahoma. He asked for one, his kind of last wish. He wanted Kentucky fried chicken, dark meat. But instead, they brought him white meat. God, that chicken. Devin Moss had a voice that rumbles low and slow like distant thunder, but this morning it was softer and more contemplative. His hands gripped the steering wheel of his rental car. He was dressed head to toe in white linen, his body glowing in an almost celestial way as he drove towards the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. Moss, a chaplain, had spent the year working as the spiritual advisor to Philip Hancock, a death row inmate in Oklahoma. The morning of the November execution had arrived. The prison had brought Hancock the wrong meal the last night before, white meat from Kentucky Fried Chicken instead of dark. That chicken I know echoed Sue Hosh, an anti-death penalty activist seated in the passenger seat beside Moss. I can't believe, right? I couldn't believe they brought him the wrong chicken. Hancock was convicted on two murders he committed in 2001. He was scheduled to be executed at 10 a.m. With three hours to go, his lawyers were still hoping that the Oklahoma governor would grant him clemency as the state parole board had voted to recommend this clemency three weeks earlier. There's a saying, an adage that says there are no atheists in foxholes. Even skeptics will pray when facing death. But Hancock, in the time leading up to his execution, only became more insistent about his non-belief. He and his chaplain were both confident that there was no God who might grant last minute salvation if only they produced a desperate prayer. The minutes moved in a torturous crawl. Soon it was 8.30, then 9 a.m. The lawyers and prison staff were waiting together, some making small talk about the rain. Around 10.10, an aide for the governor called. The execution was to move forward quickly. Over on death row, the inmates gave Hancock a send-off, kicking their doors and filling the prison with the rumbling sound 
right, of a makeshift goodbye. Because of the delay, Moss had to cut short his final minutes with Hancock. He had been told they would be together for 20 minutes, but instead they got only about 10. Phil's been shorted again, Moss thought, remembering the fried chicken. Moss was shuttled to the H unit where the execution chamber was located. He entered the sparse room where Hancock lay strapped to a gurney, wearing a gray shirt with a white sheet covering the lower half of his body. Moss was struck by how tiny the space was and the tightness of the straps slung over the gurney. He rested a hand on Hancock's knee and recited the words that he had written in his notebook. We call the spirit of humanity into this into this space, Moss said. Let love fill our hearts. We ask that in this transition into peaceful oblivion, into peaceful oblivion, that Phil feels that love. And although this is his journey, that he is not alone. We invoke the power of peace, strength, grace and surrender. Amen. Moss turned to his final words for Hancock. In the beginning of this, when I asked what you really wanted out of a spiritual care advisor, it was Philippians chapter four, he said, that you quoted to me, show me something real, show me something true. Moss looked at the face, Hancock's face, that he had come to know well, what is real is that you are loved, he told his friend. What is true is that you are not alone. What is real is that you are loved, he told his friend. What is true is that you're not alone. The curtain in front of Hancock's gurney rose at 11.13, revealing the witnesses, Hosh, two of Hancock's lawyers, the state attorney general, and an official from his office, as well as five members of the media who provided a detailed account of the execution. Hancock said jokingly, where are my enemies at? Meaning these are my friends. To Moss, his voice was the same as always, buzzing with energy. It was time for his final words. He thanked his legal team and told the attorney general, who was seated in the front row with his legs crossed, that he had been hoodwinked. He told, meaning that he was innocent. He told his witnesses that he had acted in self-defense and still hoped to be exonerated after his death. I don't want anyone out there crying for me, he added addressing Hosh, used to, I don't want you doing that. At 11.15, Hancock was given a three drug, three drug lethal injection. Midazolam for sedation, vecurionium bromide to halt respiration, and potassium chloride, which stops the heart. As his eyes closed and his chest rose and fell, liquid moving through the IV, Moss stood at his feet, hoping his friend could hear him. You are loved, Moss said, over and over, you are not alone. At 11.23, Hancock was unconscious. When his chest stopped moving and his face appeared to lose color, the prison doctor called his name, listened to his heart, opened both his eyes, and inspected them under a light. At 11.29, Hancock was pronounced dead. Even after all the words that had exchanged about existence and mortality and human cruelty, Moss hadn't been prepared for the finality of this moment. The conversation between the two had seemed sometimes as though it would never end. There were no conclusions, only more threads to unspool. Looking at Hancock's body, Moss surprised himself by murmuring a spontaneous prayer that came out involuntarily like a sneeze. He prayed that whatever came next for Hancock, they would be dealt a better set of cards. The families of the victims, Jet and Lynch, spoke in the prison's media room right afterwards. I am grateful that justice has been served according to God's will, said Lynch's niece, reading a message from her mother. I can only hope that he chose to get his soul right with God before his window of opportunity closed for eternity. Outside the execution chamber, the drizzle had turned into sheets of rain. Moss sat in his car and began to cry. 
In his hand was the paper we had written down his final message to Hancock. There were instructions he had written to himself, call the spirit of humanity into the space. And there was a sentence fragment he'd crossed out. Following the word spirit of humanity, he had written of the divine. Moss had gone back and forth on how to approach those last moments. He knew he wanted his final words to his friend to honor what both of them believed to be true. God has nothing to do with this. Well, well, well. So friends, what is, what is this story about? But this story is about being on the side of love. Now let's come close. So first, the story is beautiful. It's heart wrenching. And it also tells us where we are today. Because the truth is that God does have nothing to do with this. Now stay close, friends. Stay close. Let's just open our hearts. To cross over to the side of love is to know love's true nature. And to know love's true nature is to include all of the opposites and all of the oppositions. The God you don't believe in doesn't exist. The love that splits between people the love that says only we're the loved ones and you're not the loved ones doesn't exist. The rejection, the heresy, the rejection of God by Moss and Hancock, the heresy of Moss and Hancock is the highest faith. This is heresy. Heresy means the rejection of God which is faith, which is trust. I stand with Moss and Hancock. This is heresy, which is faith. Moss and Hancock are rejecting the small God. I mean, look at the text. He and his chaplain, Hancock and his chaplain, were both confident there was no God who might grant last minute salvation if only they produced a desperate prayer. Right, you get that caricature of God? The caricature of God that runs throughout the article, right, is a caricature of a God who might be willing to give a last minute salvation if only they would produce a desperate prayer. You get the subtle mocking, right? It's more than it's that it's conditional faith, Dorothea, you're right, but it's a mocking of God. If, if you'll just give me a desperate prayer, I'll take you through. You know, and then the end of the article, you know, the families of the victims. So he claims that it was in self-defense. We don't know we weren't there, but that's certainly a possibility. After two decades, he maintains the story and, and, and you can get his decency, he can get his goodness. And he, he clearly didn't have enough funds to hire a lawyer that would have done the work to exonerate him. And there is almost no justice in the system if you don't actually have the means the legal means, which means the finances to actually defend yourself. So there's actually a significant possibility that he was innocent. We don't know. But the families of the victims, they say, I'm grateful that justice has been served according to God's will. I can only hope that he chose to get his soul right with God before his window of opportunity closed for eternity. So clearly they're fundamentalists. And you know, if he doesn't get his soul right with God, Right, then the window closes for eternity and he's damned for eternity. So the picture of God in the article is God's on the side of the fundamentalists. Right? God is the one who's going to give you maybe a last minute salvation in exchange for a desperate prayer. Right? And the entire article, if you actually read it through carefully, right, and you and you collect, right, you know, the the, the governor is the one who can grant clemency, and he, he's claimed every square inch of Oklahoma for Jesus Christ. He can grant clemency, but he doesn't. So if, if you actually read through the article, you actually get that 
that that God here is caricatured, that God's not on the side of love. At the time of the killings, I'm going to read you one, one page of the article that I skipped. At the time of the killings, Hancock and Jett, right, this is the one of the two people who was killed, got into an argument along with Jett's friend, James Vincent Lynch. During this dispute, Hancock wrested away Jett's pistol. He then shot and killed both men. At the time of the killings, Hancock attributed his survival to God. This is something that my stepdad used to tell me. He used to say, God knows what you need before you need it. I walked out of the house thinking God had intervened on my behalf to deliver me from the hands of these violent men. During his trial, et cetera, et cetera. So he starts kind of believing in this God that protected him. And then as he studies more and more, right, and he begins to read, right, and he sees descriptions and depictions of God and kind of literal readings, right, of texts, he rejects God. But the God he rejects is a God that doesn't stand on the side of love. The God he rejects is a God who makes the claim that Jonah was physically in the whale for 90 days, even though you can't really be in a whale for 90 days or whatever the amount of time was. So there's this, the entire article caricatures the God and then says that God, that's the God that he rejected. But it goes so much more beautiful. It goes so much more deep. It goes so much more wondrous. It goes so much more stunning, right? What actually happens? He says, show me something real. Tell me something true. And what is the real and what is the something true? What do they say? We don't have God. We just have each other. But there's this sense in the article that having each other matters. And that having each other matters enormously, right, unimaginably. And what does he say? He says, we just have each other. And what does he say? He says, we call the spirit of humanity into the space. And he wrote the divine, but he took it out. But he took out the divine because that divine that he took out was the God we don't believe in. And then Moss says, let love fill our hearts. Let love fill our hearts. Why does it, what does that mean? Why does it matter that love fill our hearts? Because it's, it's the thing that matters more than anything in the world. And Moss flies down and he sublets his apartment to be there for the last month so he can be with his brother that he found and he can walk through with him. He says, let love fill our hearts. And he says to him, right, and know that you're not alone. And then he says, right, we ask that in this transition into peaceful oblivion, but if it's oblivion, how can it be peaceful? So, so he's feeling something, he's knowing something. So there's this in culture, this rejection of the surface God. There's this heresy. This is the New York Times writing. This is the center of culture that has correctly rejected the God of the great religions who is the God you don't believe in, the God you don't believe in doesn't exist, right? The God of the great religions who hijacked those gods for the sake of cruelties, the God of the great religions that in their external form were fundamentalist gods that co condemned you to eternity and hell as the relatives of the people that he killed thought might happen to him if he didn't get it right with his fundamentalist faith. But then there's this deeper understanding. There's this Hancock and there's this Moss. And, and they say, we're heretics. We reject God. But what they're doing is they're saying, no, no, no. After you reject the surface God, right? After you reject the God you don't believe in, then you begin to know something. What do you begin to know, right? That we just have each other. And that somehow a miracle happened. And Hancock found a friend. And that friend was willing to come there and to love him, and they, they loved each other. And that friend cried for him after he died. What do we want? We want a friend who will cry for us in the car after we died. And he found a friend who cried for him in the car after he died. And he found a friend who felt him, who hung on to his every word, who exchanged with him in sacred conversation, 
right? And this conversational cosmos, the cosmos came awake. The cosmos came alive in that conversation. And that conversation was God talking to God. And there's this realization, the conversation between them, that dignity matters. And that meaning matters. And that truth matters. Right? And that integrity matters. And that how we hold each other matters. Right? And, and Moss understands that he's got to wear the right clothes and that he wants to say the exact right thing. And he understands that he's going into a sacred moment and he says we invoke the power of peace, strength, grace, and surrender. Amen. Right? Right? So there's this sense of eternity. But as Wittgenstein said, the great logical positivist, eternity is not everlasting time. It's beneath space and time. It's, it's the everlasting space, right, which is forever. Now, now stay with me for a friend. Stay with me, friend. And then Hancock dies. And almost against his will, he prays. Against will, Moss prays. And he prays that whatever comes next for Hancock, it will be dealt a better, sentence, a better sense set of cards. He prays that whatever comes next for Hancock, it would be dealt a better set of cards. So what does this text tell us? This is a sacred text written not intending to be a sacred text. This morning, it was just released into culture a few hours ago. What does this text tell me? One, right, it tells me that, that the whole thing's about love. Or what does he say to him? He says to him, right, he goes back to the verse in Philippians chapter four. He says, what is real that, is that you are loved. That's one, that's true. What is real is that you are loved. Right, that's the most ultimately real statement. What does that mean? That means that reality is eros. That's what it means. Reality is eros. What's real is that you are loved. Reality is eros, right? It's insights are aligned with love. What's real is that you are loved. Not love as a social construction. Not love as a made up social contrivance. Not love is not real. Not love is just a human value that was made up as chat GPT-4 suggests. No, there's this intuitive knowing on Moss, even though Moss can't articulate it. Even though Moss understands it as being against God but it's against the God that you don't believe in, right? And Terry, this is all for you, right? What does it mean the God you don't believe in doesn't exist, right? The God you don't believe in doesn't exist is the God who would say that, that Moss and Hancock aren't gorgeous incarnations of him herself, of himself, of herself. God lives as Moss, God lives as Hancock. And when they say, right, right, all we have is each other, that's that's God loving God. So he says, what's real is that you are loved. One, what's true, goodness, truth, and beauty, what's true is that you're not alone. Right? Moss is stating metaphysical facts of reality. This is a credo of faith in its most stunning form. We have to throw out all the metaphysics. We have to throw out all the religious wars. We have to actually get to the second simplicity, what's underneath everything, but not what's real is that you're loved as a social construction. What's real, what's fucking absolutely real, reality is Eros. And Eros is the movement of separate parts into larger holes, which is the movement of the value of cosmos itself, number one. Number two is what's true is you're not alone. It's the beginning of the book of Genesis. And God said, it's not good for the human being to be alone. It's not good for the human being to be alone. God is good. And God is good that stands against aloneness. And God says, God says, not I want your desperate prayer and I'll give you a quick salvation. No, that's a caricature. That mocks God. That's the God you don't believe in. That's the small God that comes from the small comprehension, that comes from the contract itself. No, what's true is, what's true is that you're not alone. That, that sometimes we live lives of, of quiet desperation, but we never live lives of ultimately lonely desperation. We're not alone. That's two. Three, justice matters. That's very clear in the article. Justice matters. Right? Justice matters. Right? Do you get that? Justice matters. And right? he wants to be exonerated even after his death. 
He says, I was innocent. This wasn't true. This was a violation of fairness. Justice matters. That's three. Right? And four, and four, actually the journey goes on against his will. Right? What does Hancock say? Hancock says, against his will, he offers up and he says, right, I pray that whatever comes next for Hancock, he'll be dealt a better sense of, of a better set of cards, meaning justice needs to be rectified. It can't remain unjust. Fairness needs to be restored. And the journey goes on. And even in his last moments where he's trying not to pray, he says, in this journey, know that in this journey, he's not alone. So he's in a journey and he's not alone. And love is real. And he needs to be dealt a better set of cards. So justice, intimate communion, the reality of love, the integrity of justice throughout worlds. I think we just got the core of religion itself at its best, didn't we? Right? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. We have to actually reclaim a language of value. And that language of value actually intuitively knows that it's not over when it's over. It's not over at the moment of death. Intuitively, Moss understands and prays that he'll be dealt a better set of cards, right, as his journey goes on, right, quite literally, right, as, as he goes, right, whatever's next for him. We actually understand that if it's over when it's over, it's a violation of fairness. It's actually a violation of justice. And Moss understands and Hancock understands. And they engage in this fierce, gorgeous, sacred heresy. They refuse to accept a small God. They refuse to accept a traumatized, contracted God. They refuse to adopt a superficial or petty faith that will give them petty and superficial comfort. They want the pleasure of true gnosis, of true knowing. The pleasure of knowing that love is real. It, that what's true is that you're not alone. That justice matters. And that the way we love each other in the details matters. It matters when I ask for my last meal and I want dark meat. And, and basically the system ignores me and they bring me white meat. And it's not okay. That's a violation of the divine. No, no, no. You got to dignity. Dignity matters. Honor matters. Even in the last moments of life. Wow. So to be on the side of love, right, is to be on the side of God. There's no separation between those. There's no God versus love. Right? To be on the side of, of love is to be on the side of God. And to be on the side of God is to be on the side of love. And that means that we have to let go, right, of the superficial dogmas. We have to let go of the superficial dogmas of fundamentalism and of fundamentalist scientism. And I want to, I want you to get what happens in this article. And this is the last two minutes. Right, and then we're gonna, we're gonna go and we're gonna pray together because what could we do more now than to pray, right? And he, right, he offers a prayer, right? Moss, our atheist, offers a prayer. But, but I want to get this. The article sets up exactly where the intelligentsia of culture is today that defines the academy, that defines the university, that defines the default assumption of the decision makers in, in culture. Right? This article is New York Times classical. It's CNN classical. What it basically says is, is you've got fundamentalism on the one side, and fundamentalism in the article is, is the governor who claims every inch of Jesus Christ, right, for God, but of course, doesn't give clemency, right? The, the fundamentalist God is the God that he learned growing up in school where he was mocked, right, by the assemblies of God people for being a sinful, abominate Methodist, right? The fundamentalist God is, is those at the end, right, who celebrate his death and say that if he didn't get it right with his fundamentalism, he's condemned for eternity. That's the fundamentalist God. And that God is rejected by Moss and it's rejected by Hancock. And it's rejected obviously by the writer of the article. That's a gorgeous rejection. But then they set up on the other side, somehow the other side's against God. No. And that was never true in the great religions. The great religions always had a deeper view. 
they always had a deeper realization. The great religions themselves at their best understood exactly what the writer of the article knows in her body but can't quite express, which is there are basic tenets to religion, which is really geared to reconnect. And what are those tenets? What are the tenets of a world religion? So we came together here to be on the side of love. In a world religion, we're on the side of love. This article expresses gorgeously the core tenets of a world religion. And it does it from the text. And what's the text? Philippians in the New Testament, chapter 4. What does Philippians say? Show me something real. Show me something true. So one, tenet one, what is real is that you are loved. But we go beyond the article. It's not just because it's a psychological reality in this moment. No, no, there's this understanding, even though Moss and Hancock don't have the words to articulate it, they understand this is more than psychology. This is real. Reality is eros. Its insides are lined with love. It's an amorous cosmos. It's an intimate universe. And so this act of intimacy between these two men is an ultimate expression of God. God is the infinite intimate. And this is a new quality of intimacy between Hancock and Moss that never existed before. And it's a stunning quality of the infinite intimate. And in Hancock and Moss, a new God is literally born. There's more God to come. And it matters. That's two. What's true is you're not alone. Right? So one and two. Love is real. Right? You're not alone. Right? Reality is eros. It's in a communion. Everything's connected to everything else. And three, justice matters. Right? And four, you're on a journey. And the next stage of the journey, you got to get dealt the right cards. The cards are going to balance out. There's an ultimate coherence through reality. There's an ultimate fairness. There's an ultimate fairness. It's actually not true that because Hancock couldn't afford a lawyer and other people could, so that actually guilty people hired the best lawyer and got off. And perhaps an innocent person was sent to his death. And that's the end of the story. No, that's not true. No, that's a violation. And Hancock knows it and, and Moss knows it. And Hancock knows it's important for me to be exonerated after my death. It matters. Justice matters. Is three and four, there is a continuity of consciousness. And that's why the prayer emerges from Moss. There is a continuity of consciousness. Right? Death is a night between two days. Right? And that's a truth of reality. Those are the four truths of a world religion. Right? Right? We need to be heretics, my friends. We need to be heretics. There's heresy, which is faith. That's Tomas and Hancock. And there's faith, which is heresy. That's the faith of the fundamentalism in the article, the faith in the small God. That's faith, which is heresy. That's faith, which denies God, which denies love. And there's never a split between God and love. Can't be. Right? We are the church of evolutionary love, right? It's a religion of love. Love is religion and religion is love. There's no split between them. They are actually one and the same. But love is not, love is not insipid. Love is fierce and makes demands. It rips us apart. It's a holy and a broken hallelujah. It demands everything from us. We'll talk about that next week. What is love? What is this force of love? Right? It's not all sweetness and light. It's not just tenderness. It's fierce quivering, pulsing tenderness that rips us apart and puts us back together. And somehow we come out more whole. Somehow we come out more God. Somehow we become not merely homo sapien, we cross over to the other side and we become homo more. But that was our sacred text for today. And thank you for listening. And thank you, Dr. Mark Guffney, for that amazing beautiful hopeful journey and um yeah let's let's be like ross and and like hancock as we are becoming homo more the fulfillment of homo sapiens so in that beautiful story in the beautiful article ross is on the phone with hancock just like we are right now we're on a zoom call 
um, but actually let's come together in person because that's where new intimacy is born that's where the new new gods are being born and the way that we love each other matters so 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 much that well that's what we heard today that's what we received today so let's actually be in person together so we can look each other in the eyes so we can feel each other so we can hold each other's hands so we can dance together so we can study the dharma together and we can practice together and chant together it's going to be amazing going to come together for three days april 25th until april 28th um, in holland in europe so i really really hope uh, to get to meet you there and hug you there um, and so yes the next invitation is let's become a member of one mountain if you go to the website one mountain many you will find a place called membership and that's where you can read all about it membership is really a way to resource our home so definitely those of you who are here every week everyone has to just be signed up as a member because that's the way that we contribute to this beautiful revolution and make sure that it gets heard by more and more and more people and more and more and more people on this beautiful planet earth will live by this principle that they know that they are loved we have beautiful uh, study groups where we're loving and practicing together um, we have uh, actually also prayer every day if you want to join that please uh, write me about that um, and i'll put my email in the chat box but most of all Let's let's make this re revolution happen together by becoming a member of One Mountain. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here, for supporting uh, the revolution, for sharing your valuable time. Really, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.